in verse things can turn out for good. Now in this chapter, we see that Paul is in prison, and as we've seen in our previous study, it, it, it's, it seems like he's happy. He's joyful in spite of going through some difficult times. And as you go through the book of Philippians, you'll see that the word rejoice or joy appears 16 times. And so we might ask the question, so how is that possible? How can a man be happy in such adversity? How can a man be joyful in such adversity? And, well, I guess we would have to conclude either he's mentally unstable <laughs> or um, he's lying. Or maybe thirdly, he's onto something. He's got something that keeps him joyful in spite of going through these difficulties in his life. You know, the way we tend to process life is that if I get what I want, I'll be happy. I probably plan my future. I've, I've got my plans laid out. I'll get married, and then I'll do this. I'll have children. I'll have a business, or I'll work here. And, I, and you kind of plan out your life, how you're going to do it. And if things turn out that way, well, you're happy, right? You know, I had a, a person, we were talking once, and <clears throat> he told me, and he was 30 years old at the time, he said, you know what, I had all my dreams, and I wanted to come to a certain point in my life and have so and so much money, and then I'd be, you know, kind of set and, you know, ready to retire. He said he was 30 years old, and he had met every single one of those goals, and he was kind of like, so I'm 30 now, and I, I'm where I wanted to be when I was 60, and so it's like, <clears throat> so what's next? Well, the truth is that people can be successful outwardly, financially, and yet be very miserable. And so just outward success doesn't make a person happy. Even if all your goals are met, everything turned out the way you wanted it to, you can still be miserable. So we see that just me reaching outward goals are not necessarily going to make you happy. I read an article that was written by a professor in the University of Austin, Texas, and he was explaining why successful people often are unhappy. And this is what he wrote. He says, in summary, he said, uh, they always measure themselves with someone else who is better than them. More degrees, more better grades, how many awards someone else gets, or uh, maybe you get a raise and you are happy for two months. Then you get used to it, and you need another raise in order to sustain your level of happiness. And he calls it the hedonic treadmill. And so that's what happens. It, it's like you got that goal, and you're you know, happy, but then it kind of fades. And then you need another high, if you would. Well, we know that the plans that Paul had for his own life didn't work out the way he wanted them to. And he's still happy. He's filled with joy in spite of adversity. You know, the Lord has editing rights over our life. You know, he created us in our mother's womb. And he is the one who really has ultimately the editing rights. We have our plans, but the Lord might edit them. He might change them occasionally. And life doesn't always turn out the way we want it to. And the question is, how do I react? How do you react when you encounter a bump in the road? You know, before we go to verse 12, you know, when it comes to happiness and joy, there's, there's a difference in the two. One is that happiness depends on happenings, on circumstances. You know, you're happy because things turn out the way you wanted to. You got a good crop, or you got a raise, or business is good. So you're happy, happy because the happenings are going your way. But yet, joy is inward. It is based on something other than happenings. And we'll look at that in just a moment. So let's begin reading in verse 12. It says, 
But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. So that it has been become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Now, if you look at the life of Paul, as we've seen, he's in prison. He would have every reason to be depressed and miserable. You know, first of all, when he went a couple years earlier, when he arrived in Jerusalem, he was falsely accused of bringing Gentiles into the temple, desecrating the temple, and as a result, imprisoned. And there he was, falsely accused, put in prison for two years, well, he wasn't released, actually over two years, he wasn't released, and became whole, the whole thing became political. And finally, he appealed to Caesar. Well, he was then thrown on a cargo ship, and then ultimately on a slave ship, shipwrecked, bitten by a snake. Finally, he made it to Rome, only to be in prison and to be held guard and have a soldier tied or chained to him. So imagine... No privacy. You go to the bathroom, you have someone chained to you. You go to bed, you have someone chained to you. And yet, in spite of this, Paul remains joyful. You know, I read a quote, and I think there might be a lot of truth to this one. It says, spiritual maturity is measured by what it takes to rob you of your joy. I thought, wow, that, that might be, you know, how much does it take, you know, how much editing can God do in my life? How many bumps, how many bends can God put into my life before I begin to lose my joy? So what kept Paul so joyful? Well, I believe this phrase here in verse 12, 12 gives us a clue. It says here, note the phrase, furtherance of the gospel. You know, everyone has a passion of some kind. You know, and I'm not talking about just a hobby that you have in the sideline. You have a hobby and you, you know, tinker away in the weekends. But you have a goal in life. You know, and you become, it's something that you're passionate about. It's, it's some people are so passionate about achieving their goals in life that they're willing to sacrifice certain things. Some people are willing to sacrifice even their family. They put them on the second burner, on the back burner, their wife, their relationships, because they are so passionate about something. Well, for Paul, this passion was the gospel. Look in verse 5. For the fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. I want you to see how many times he uses this verse, this, this word, verse 7. Just as it is right for me to think of you all, because I have you in my heart, and as much as both in my chains and in my defense and confirmation of the gospel. And then in verse 12 that we just read, but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Verse um, 15, some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, um, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition and not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense, here we have the word again, of the gospel. And then if you turn to verse 27, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel. So we see here that Paul uses this phrase over and over. He uses it actually some 70 times in his writings. So it is clear that his joy, his passion is the gospel. It's the word of God. Paul was obsessed, if you would, if one can use that word, with the gospel. You know, he was a man that before he hated the gospel. He hated it with a passion. In fact, he uses the term that he persecuted the gospel. He was so antagonistic, it was like a wild boar, you know, just destroying and ripping up the gospel. But then something happened to him. What happened to him? The gospel. <laughs> the gospel happened to him. He was saved. 
because of the message of the gospel, and, and, and he became really, an, from an opponent, he became a proponent for the gospel. <clears throat> so the gospel got a hold of him. You know, he was converted. And I think what drove Paul was he saw the power of the gospel. He saw the power of the gospel in having the ability to change lives, to change people. It changed him completely, a year turn, from, from being you know, an enemy of, of Jesus to being his friend, to being his servant. And so he was passionate about the gospel. And so his object of joy, I really believe, was the gospel. It was Christ, the message of Jesus. He was passionate about that. You know, his sufferings, or, or let's put it this way, his eyes were not on his personal sufferings, but on the gospel. He did not mind being where he was as long as the gospel went forth. Now look in verse 12. It says, the things that have happened to me. Now, when he talks about the things that have happened to me, maybe he's talking about the la over the last several years, all his imprisonments in Caesarea and, and now in Rome. You know, his plans were completely shattered. If you look in the book of Ro uh, Romans, uh, Paul was in Corinth when he wrote the book of Romans, and he was writing to the Romans where he is right now, and he was writing to them, and he was... He was expressing his desire to come to Rome and to, to, to meet with them. I'll read it to you in Romans chapter 1 and verse 9. It says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests, if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. See, see, the, see Paul's plan? See, Paul was planning ahead. Okay, so I'm going to do, do this. I'm now on my second missionary journey. I'll go to my third and I, or whatever, and, and I'll go to Rome. That was his long-distant goal. I, I'll go to Rome. And obviously he was thinking about maybe a safe and a fruitful trip, right? A nice trip to Rome. Well, God edited those plans. He did go to Rome, but I don't think he went the way he wanted. He went, as I said, in a cargo ship, ultimately in a slave ship, in chains. It was not the way he wanted to go. And now he is in Rome... And I'm sure his desire when he was writing that he was going to be free and he was going to be able to, to just travel wherever he wanted. But now he is in Rome, yes, but he is in chains. He is in chains. He's restricted. You know, I think that we can feel, you can feel in your life like that. You can feel like you have a chain. You can feel restricted. Maybe... A relationship or maybe a job maybe it's your family or some situation that you're in it's it's like you're chained to this thing and you'd like to be free and the danger is that when you see yourself that way that you're in chains you can't get rid of it that you can develop or begin to see yourself as a victim I'm a victim. I'm in chain. I'm chained. I'm a victim. Paul, in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, he wrote this. He says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. And I believe that Paul understood that. He understood that. That when his plans were edited by the Lord, that ultimately he could trust God in spite of adversity. And as, as a result, he didn't see himself as a victim because he saw that God added his rights, his, his, his plans, and he, he saw it as something that, was, that came his way from the Lord. I believe that Paul understood Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 11. It says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace 
and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And so Paul trusted God. That in all this, something good would come out of it. And I believe that was his philosophy. Something's going to come out of this. These are chains that I'm in. I'm restricted, but some, God has a plan. Now, if you look at Romans 8, 28, it says this way. It says, all things work together for good. Now, we might say if some things work together for good or most things work together for good, but it says all things work together for good. And that included Paul's chains. That might include some of your chains, whatever they might be. All things. And so when God edits the plans of your life, in a way that you don't like, how do you react? Do you cling to Romans 8, 28 like Paul did? Notice in verse 12, it says, But I want you to know. In other words, Paul says, I want there to be no misunderstanding. I don't want any misunderstanding here. I want you to know that the things that happened actually worked out for the furtherance of the gospel. In other words, the imprisonments have not hindered or stopped the gospel. In fact, they have furthered the gospel. How? Well, by Paul being chained to a soldier. By various Jewish leaders, they came to Paul while he was in prison, and he was able to share the gospel with them. And, um, well, just back up a little bit. If we look at, at the Roman church, and, you know, it was, was there, and it was, it was growing, no doubt. And we know that during this period of time, that persecution was ramping up. Um, some Christians were fleeing at this time from Rome. We know that at the Colosseum, uh, Christians were fed to the lions and so forth. This was, this was already beginning to happen during the time of Paul. I was in the Colosseum, and we had a, a tour there in Rome, and, and um, it, it was interesting that the tour guide, you know, he wanted to protect, I guess, the Romans, or he was just like, you know, the question was asked, one of the, the, the team that was there uh, asked the question, so how about feeding the Christians to the lions, and he completely denied it. You know, he says, no, no, that didn't happen, you know, it's just a story, it's fake. It's not true. It is totally in history. But, but it was just interesting. But it was happening during the time of Paul. And, um, and so you can imagine, the church is beginning to pray, Lord, help us to reach out. And there's some here that are, you know, they're afraid of persecution and so forth. And it's so difficult. Please reach Caesar's household. Please reach those guards, those those fierce-looking guards, please, you know, reach these guards. And, and, and they're, they're praying and they're interceding for, for the church there in, in Rome, or for the government there in, in, in Rome. Well, God answers their prayer. He sends Paul to Rome as a prisoner, and he has these Roman guards chained to his, to his arm. And every six hours, there's a shift. And so Paul gets to preach the gospel to the guards there in, in, in Rome. Can you imagine that many nights when Paul was probably on his bed, the Roman guard was there, and Paul, in the late night with the candles burning, they were talking about life and talking about Jesus and talking about the Lord, and this hardened guard, his heart began to melt, and he began to, you know, uh, show interest and ultimately receive Christ. And then the chains, the, 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 he was, uh, the guard was traded and, and this guard went home and he went into Caesar's household and he, he, he preached the gospel there and, and it just, the gospel just permeated into Caesar's household. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 22, Paul is going to greet the, the, the Philippians, and he says this way, all the, the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. See, the saints in Caesar's household, they were saved. 
So the gospel wasn't hindered. In fact, it continued to go forth um, even while he was in chains. Now, talking about Paul's ministry and his fruitfulness in ministry, I'll just read a couple verses to you from Acts chapter 28, beginning in verse 16. It says, Now when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. But Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with the soldier who guarded him. And it came to pass after three days that Paul called the leaders of the Jews together. So we see the Pauls in prison, but the leaders of the church are coming to him. Verse 23, so when they, the day appointed, so when they had appointed him a day, many came to him at his lodging to whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning till evening. And then in verse 30 it says, Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concerned the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence no one forbidding him. See, the gospel was not hindered at all in spite of his chains. In fact, it was further. Why? Because Paul had no fear of persecution. Because he had a personal bodyguard paid by the Roman government. So it didn't hinder the gospel at all. Could it be that you are experiencing a bend in the road which is currently unpleasant but it might be an answer to prayer. It just might be an answer to prayer. Now, if you look in verse 12 and 13, it says here, But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest. Now, who are the rest? Well, the rest in Rome. Um, the Jewish leaders who came to talk to him in Romans chapter 28, uh, Acts chapter 28. You know what? Paul's longest time of, an, of incarceration came to be the most fruitful time of his ministry. He was able to impact the Roman government. He was able to impact the Jewish leaders. He was able to impact the many people that came to him unhindered. There were, maybe there were many Nicodemuses out there who, was, who were afraid, who wanted to make a commitment, who wanted to know more about the gospel, but they were kind of afraid. So they were able to come to Paul to his rented house and hear from Paul personally. And it was during this time, while he was in prison, that he had time to write. And he wrote the book of Ephesians, the book of Philippians, the book of Colossians, and the book of Philemon. All of this during these two years of imprisonment. We know that Paul later was released for a short period of time, at, during which he wrote 1 Timothy and Titus. But he was recaptured, and this time he was not in a rented house, but he was thrown into a dungeon. And there he was, um, and there he wrote Second Timothy. Now, I've been to his prison there, and if you, if you, if you go there and, and, and you look at this hole that basically where Paul was in and where they let the food through and, and all, that when the Colosseum, when they were feeding the Christians to the lions, Paul heard it in his prison. It's close enough. Well, we see that Paul was not hindered. The gospel was not hindered. In fact, it was, it was, it was further during, during this period of time. Look in verse 14. It says there, um, And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains. See, his chains emboldened the saints in Rome. See, evidently, many Christians had lacked courage because there was persecution. And when they saw Paul's courage in sharing the gospel to the guards and, and getting them saved, they thought, if God can use Paul in prison, surely he can use us out of prison. 
And so it encouraged the church to speak up. And the gospel was furthered. You know what? I think it is possible that we can miss God's appointments in our life by having a wrong perspective and focusing on the inconvenience rather than on Christ and his plans. We can miss God's appointment by not accepting the bends in the road and making the most of them and not having the faith and standing on God's promises, as it says in Romans 8, 28, and believing that somehow through this, God will be honored. Paul looked at his disappointment as God's appointment. Remember Joseph in the Old Testament when he was sold as a slave to Egypt? I mean, what good can come out of that? But we know that he became the prime minister and ultimately he saved the entire Egypt and his entire family as a result. And, and after his father and, and his, um, his, his, his brothers had come to Egypt and you know, he was taking care of them, they were staying there and his father died. They buried him. Then his brothers became afraid. And they said, now Joseph is going to pay us back for what we did to him. And you know what Joseph said there in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20? He says, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Suppose they had prayed, God, we just, you know, reject what has happened. We refuse to accept it as from the Lord. It was God's plan. God allowed it. It, it, was, it. was it pleasant for Jacob and his family? No. But God in his sovereignty allowed it to happen. Joseph in his hardship also applied the principle of Romans 8.28. Joseph saw good come out of his difficult experience. Paul saw good come out of his difficult experience. Martin Luther was under the, the, the threat of death. Emperor uh, Charles had ordered his death. And if you know the story, he was uh, kidnapped by a friend, really, who then was able to, uh, you know, whiff him away. And, and he came to the Wetworth Castle um, where really he was in hideout during that period of time. He was hiding there. He, he allowed his grow, beard to grow and, and all stuff to make sure people wouldn't recognize him. He changed his name and all that. But during this time, really, of incarceration, because he had to stay in hiding, he suffered depression and numerous physical ailments. It was a difficult period of life for Martin Luther. But you know what? It was during this period of time that he wrote furiously. And it was during this time that he translated the German Bible. He turned it from Greek to German. That's where we have, that's the Bible that I grew up with. The one that Martin Luther translated when he went through the most difficult times of his life. The chains, the restrictions turned out for good. Many millions have been blessed by the German Bible. Now, Martin Luther could have said, I reject this in Jesus' name. No. He accepted it. And he, and, he, and he worked through it. And ultimately, it was a huge blessing. John Bunyan was in prison for 12 years. And it was during the period of time when he was in prison that he wrote the book, uh, Pilgrim's Progress which has blessed so many millions of people throughout, you know, the centuries. I'll, I'll close with this writing by Max Locato. And this is what he said. 
writing there of this man who named, was named Robert. He says, I have, this is what Robert said, I have everything I need for joy. Robert Reed said, amazing, I thought. His hands were twisted and his feet are useless. He can't bathe himself. He can't feed himself. He can't brush his teeth, comb his hair, or put on his underwear. His shirts are held together by strips of Velcro. His speech drags like a worn out audio cassette. Robert has cerebral palsy. The disease keeps him from driving a car, riding a bike, and going for a walk, but didn't keep him from graduating from high school or attending Abilene Christian University, from which he graduated with a degree in Latin. Having cerebral palsy didn't keep him from teaching at a St. Louis Junior College or from venturing overseas on five mission trips. And Robert's disease didn't prevent him from becoming a missionary in Portugal. He moved to Lipson alone in 1972. There he rented a hotel room and began studying Portuguese. He found a restaurant owner who would feed him after the rush hour and tutor, and a tutor who would instruct him in the language. Then he stationed himself daily in a park where he distributed brochures about Christ. Within six years, he had led 70 people to the Lord, one of whom became his wife, Rosa. I heard Robert speak recently. I watched other men carry him in his wheelchair onto the platform. I watched him lay a Bible in his lap. I, I watched him lay a Bible in his lap. I watched his stiff fingers force open the pages, and I watched people in the audience wipe away tears of admiration from their faces. Robert could have asked for sympathy or pity, but he did just the opposite. He held his bent hand up in the air and boasted, I have everything I need for joy. His shirts are held together by Velcro, but his life is held together by joy. Father, we thank you so much for these verses here in Philippians. And we see that Paul in spite of adversity, in spite of these chains, he made the most of it. He trusted you. He trusted that, that you had a plan for his life and, and, and that he, he, he gave you the right to edit his life. And when that happened, he looked at what he could have seen as a nuisance, these guards, he saw them as a mission field. And Father, we just pray that you would give us the faith to trust what you might be saying to us. That you would become our object or goal or passion in life at all times. And Lord, that our lives might be a sweet smelling aroma to you. And so we just surrender, Lord, and we just say, Lord, we trust you. In Jesus' name.